rotates around the axis of the imperishable Brahman. It has 13 spokes, 360 joints, six rims, and numberless leaves carved upon it. Uh, though its revolution cut short the lifespan of the entire creation, this wheel of tremendous velocity cannot touch the lifespan of the devotees of the Lord. Report by Srila Prabhupada. The time factor cannot affect the span of life of the devotees. In Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that the little execution of devotional service saves one from the greatest danger. The greatest danger is transmigration of the soul from one body to another, and only devotional service to the Lord can stop this process. It is stated in the Vedic literatures, Harim Vina Nashritim Taranti. Without the mercy of the Lord, one cannot stop the cycle of birth and death. In Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that only by understanding the transcendental nature of the Lord and his activities, his appearance and disappearance, can one stop the cycle of death and go back to him. The time factor is divided into many fractions of moments, hours, months, years, periods, seasons, etc. All the divisions in this verse are determined according to the astronomical calculations of Vedic literature. There are six seasons called Ritus, and there is the period of four months called Chatur Masya. Three periods of four months complete one year. According to Vedic astronomical calculations, there are 13 months. The 13th month is called Adi Masa or Mala Masa <coughs> and is added every third year. The time factor, however, cannot touch the lifespan of the devotees. In another verse, it is stated that when the sun rises and sets, it takes away the life of all living entities, but it cannot take away the life of those who are engaged in devotional service. Time is compared here to a big wheel which has 360 joints, six rims in the shape of seasons, and numberless leaves in the shape of moments. It rotates on the eternal existence, Brahman. Shri Chaitanya Manohobhistam Stapitam Yenabhutale Mayam Rupakatamayam Dhyatatatispapadantikam So the translation again. Your wheel, which has three naves, rotates around the axis of the imperishable Brahman. It has 13 spokes, 360 joints, six rims, and numberless leaves carved upon it. Though its revolution cut short the lifespan of the entire creation, this wheel of tremendous velocity cannot touch the lifespan of the devotees of the Lord. So I just happened to see an advertisement for a tragic movie. It had a picture of a young woman's face, and it said, in three months, she will not be able to recognize her face. In six months, she won't be able to use her hand. In a year, only a miracle can save her. Apparently it's a story about someone who has some irreversible disease which is going to slowly reduce their body to its original elements. So, uh, looking at that ad, I was just thinking, well, all you have to do is multiply the times a little bit, and this applies to anybody. Say, well, let's see, in 30 years you won't recognize your face. Surely in 50 years, only a miracle will save you. <laughs> so, uh, there's this time factor which carries things away. And here it is uh, referred to using the idea of the year as a wheel. So, uh, there are a number of things that can be said about this. I was thinking one interesting point has to do with the idea that everything passes away. Um, this is a bit mysterious. It turns out uh, in physics, uh, if you look at the basic equations the physicists have governing matter, it turns out that they're time reversible, which means that you can run everything backwards. Um, and that means in one sense, nothing ever passes away, according to those equations. 
so uh, it's a bit of a paradoxical situation which caused quite a bit of controversy in uh, physics because we see that things do pass away. But if the fundamental equations of physics say that things don't pass away, well, what's going on there? And it turns out if you look into it, um, a lot of issues come into play because what happens is, according to the laws of physics, uh, large-scale structures that you can see, uh, such as what you see in this room, people's bodies and the structure of the room and so forth, these are gradually transformed into submicroscopic patterns in the course of time. So that means that in one sense, they never pass away because they continue to exist on a submicroscopic level. But on, on the other hand, they do pass away in the sense that obviously when a pattern becomes submicroscopic, it's no longer part of our experience. So things are continually going out of large-scale existence and into submicroscopic existence. But since the equations of physics are time-reversible, that means the opposite thing has to be happening. So things must be continually passing from submicroscopic state of existence up to a large-scale state. And that includes everything that we see. So that's an implication of physics, but it's interesting to see that actually that's not accepted because uh, no one is accepting that, for example, the pattern that represents you, let's say a hundred years ago, existed on a submicroscopic level and now it's just become manifest. Uh, whereas it will be accepted that the pattern that defines you as a physical body, that is, uh, in a hundred years, will continue to exist as a submicroscopic pattern. So as far as physics goes, it's completely symmetrical. But what you find is non-acceptance of the first thing and acceptance of the second, which is uh, a little bit of a paradox hidden in, in modern science. But of course, the trouble with the, the first idea, namely that your existence was in the form of a submicroscopic pattern that became amplified, um, one wonders, well, where did the submicroscopic pattern come from? Now, of course, it's the fact that uh, in, on one level, this is accepted that this happens, because when an embryo develops from a fertilized egg, you have a pattern within the egg, which is certainly on a microscopic level, namely, uh, on the level of the DNA, making up the genes and so forth. And then that is read out and somehow transformed to produce the, uh, the ultimate uh, child that emerges. So you do have things on a submicroscopic level coming up to the macroscopic. But the question is, where did the patterns come from on the submicroscopic level? And if you look at this uh, picture of physics, uh, objectively, you'll see that what you, you ultimately would have to conclude is that either it was there from eternity on a submicroscopic level or else some other agency had to insert it at some point. And that would be a, a process of creation, which is a little bit of a problem from the modern scientific perspective. But anyway, what you do find is that there's a symmetry, as far as physics goes, between creation and annihilation. And curiously enough, in Vedic literature, you also have a symmetry between creation and annihilation in the material cosmos. And then in the spiritual world, you don't have either of those principles. You just have everything eternally existing. So the uh, process of generating the material energy is one in which the two principles of uh, Tamagun and Rajagun are introduced. Tamagun is the principle that destroys everything and breaks everything down, and Rajagun is the principle of creation that builds everything up. And these are sort of two sides of the same coin. So anyway, some observations about uh, time. Ultimately, time is a bit of a mystery. 
what is time anyway? So, uh, now, it's been said that uh, astronomers don't address the question of what is time. They just measure it, which is a lot easier than figuring out what it ultimately is. So I just thought I'd mention something about the different uh, uh, numbers pointed out in this verse. Curious thing about this verse is that this is very much like the kind of thing that you can find in the Rig Veda. Uh, you'll find verses almost identical to this in the Rig Veda. Um, it refers to the year, for example, as having 360 days, which is interesting. But there's, uh, and if you look through the entire Bhagavatam, you will not anywhere find a reference to the year as having 365 days. 360 days in every uh, instance. But this is uh, a reference to a more sophisticated system based on lunar months. Um, it turns out that in the Vedic system, the month is uh, typically lunar. There are some solar month systems also. But uh, a lunar month is determined by the phases of the moon. And it's can go from full moon to full moon. In our calendar, that's how the months are, are measured. Um, it's also possible for the lunar months to go from new moon to new moon. So if it goes from new moon to new moon, that's called Amanta, and full moon to full moon is called Purnimanta. And in most of northern India today, the Purnimanta system is used, but it used to be that the Amanta system was more common and in South India, I understand that that is still the one that is used. So, uh, now as it happens, the lunar month uh, is just short of 30 days in length. Actually, it's uh, 29.53 days. And this creates uh, various complexities. Because, uh, well, for one thing, you don't have a, an integer number of days in a month. So what they did was take that 29.53 days and divide it into 30 equal intervals. And those are called tithis. Uh, and so then you have 30 of those in a month. So it works out very nicely. Uh, it turns out that, that a codice, for example, is a tithi. A codice is not an ordinary 24-hour day, but it's uh, one of these 30th of a month divisions. So, now, as it turns out, if you have 12 months, which are about 29 point something days, you see that doesn't come out even to 360 days. It comes out a little bit short of 360. Uh, so, what do you do? Well, Srila Prabhupada is pointing out here what, in fact, is done. It turns out you come about 10 days short, and so, in three years, you're about 30 days short. So you add another month, and that's an Adi Masa. Uh, that's the 13th month that's being referred to in this verse. And it turns out that there are fairly sophisticated calculations for doing that. Um, now I was looking into that, and um, there's an interesting story there having to do with the beginning of Kali Yuga. Now, we say that Kali Yuga began 5,000 years ago. But in fact, there's an exact date that Kali Yuga began on February 18, 3102 B.C. Uh, A.M. Let me be more exact. <laughs> Kali Yuga began at 12 o'clock in the morning on February 18th, 3102 B.C. Now, this isn't like the Bishop of Usher calculating when the creation occurred, which was uh, 4004 B.C. Um, it turns out you can find out what Vedic month that date corresponds to. And, in fact, if you go back in time and consider all the Adi Masas and so forth, Going back to that date, you find that that date is the first of Chaitra, 
in 3102 BC, which is interesting because uh, there are different systems also in India for the beginning of the year. And Srila Prabhupada alludes to that here. Pretty much the system we follow, although we don't really talk about it much, is the one in which uh, Marga Shirsha is the beginning of the year. Uh, that's the next month after Kartik. In other words, Kartik ends the year, and then it begins again with Mar- Marga Shirsha. But uh, another system is it begins with Chaitra. So, uh, Kali Yuga then begins on the first of Chaitra, which is appropriate. Now, the interesting thing is, astronomically, it's also quite true. Uh, if you look at that date, 1st of Chaitra, 3102 B.C., you'll find that that's a new moon day. In fact, on that date, the, the sun and the moon are precisely lined up, which means it's a new moon. And uh, another interesting feature is these month names are named after constellations of stars. So Kartik, for example, is named after Kritika, and Kritika is the Pleiades. Uh, any morning you can you can see that before Mangalarti. Um, so uh, Chaitra is named after Chitra, which is another star. There are uh, 27 nakshatras with different names, and the months are named after them. And the system was that a month is named after a nakshatra in which the moon becomes full during that month. That's the original system. So it turns out that if you look at that date, 3102 BC, the first of Chaitra, and then you go 15 days and you come to the full moon, the moon actually has a conjunction with Chitra. So it's an exact matchup. Now, it turns out that there are a lot of other curious features about this date. Uh, It seems that all of the planets are lined up at that date. Uh, Now, they're not lined up perfectly because they never line up perfectly in a straight line, but they come as close as they ever come. And in fact, one way to calculate that date is go backwards with uh, an astronomy ephemeris and uh, look for... Uh, alignment of all of the planets uh, in which uh, the sun and moon go opposite uh, Chitra and you'll get that date you'll get exactly uh, the uh, 18th of February 3102 BC so the date is completely determined astronomically and another curious thing about it is if you look at Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, which supposedly weren't even known prior to 100 years ago, uh, you'll find that they're lined up at that date also. So uh, that's just a little bit about the the Kali Yuga date. Uh, Of course, the idea is that uh, that's a change of yugas, so everything lines up as a, a new starting point at that at that time. That's the concept behind it. So, uh, when we say that uh, Krishna's pastimes and so on took place 5,000 years ago, you can make a much more precise statement, (laughs) as it turns out. There's a lot more to that than uh, meets the eye. So, hmm. Yeah. So, I'll stop there. Are there any questions? Yeah? I couldn't quite hear. What? Advantage the lunar calendar versus the solar calendar. Well, the uh, one advantage of the lunar calendar is that if you can count and look at the sky, you can tell what month it is. Uh, in fact, it was a very practical system for people who knew the constellation because when the moon is full or near to being full, you just see where it is in the sky and by what constellation it is near, you know what the, the month is. And in practice, you have to 
do a little bit of simple calculation in order to know where you are in the month. But basically speaking, that would mean that anybody, let's say a farmer or cowherd boy or whatever, could know what the date was just by looking at the sky. So in that sense, it was a practical system. Whereas nowadays, I don't think we can do that. Uh, how are we going to know what the date is unless we have a calendar? So, um, on the other hand, you get into this complexity of the added months and so forth. So that becomes quite uh, complicated. Uh, the Surya Siddhanta has a calculation for that that uses uh, a series of 15-digit numbers. The neat thing, though, is the calculation works all the way back to that Kali Yuga date. I checked it out. And that means it works for the last uh, 5,000 years without making a mistake of a single day in the entire time, which is not bad. But uh, anyway, yeah? Excuse me? That is about Gaur Purnima, um, February 18th. Uh, you see there's a gradual shifting of things as the centuries go by. But, uh, yeah, that's about Gaur Purnima time, roughly speaking. Excuse me? I couldn't quite hear. What? Yeah. Oh, well, the, the Western calendar is a little bit strange if you look at uh, September, October, November, December, because it's 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, so you're off by two. So some, at some point, some change was made in the, in the month system in the West, because we're off by two months. December should be 12, not 10. It's hard to say. The Western calendar is solar, of course. Uh, in India, they also have a solar system. Uh, the date given for Lord Chaitanya's birth that uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur gave is based on solar month. Um, so, because what was it, 23rd of Falgoon, something like that? Uh, it's not a lunar month, that's a solar month. In the solar month, you just take the 365 and a quarter days and divide them into 12 equal units. So then that has nothing to do with the moon, necessarily. The moon can land anywhere. In a, a full moon can land anywhere in a solar month. But uh, in one sense, it's easier as far as the, the year is concerned. Merle Vodica? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a rather helter-skelter theory if you think about it. Because it means that uh, just like everything that you have in this room, all the people in it, all the detailed features of them, would be stored up, let's say, uh, a million years ago in the form of tiny situations in the position of atoms. So all that would have to be encoded in that way. In such a way, then, as time passes, that information comes out and finally becomes manifest to form the uh, patterns of people and so on that you see in this room. So it's just like a completely this ununified catalog of information. You just have to say that all that data is just there. And it was there a million years ago because it was there a million and one years ago. And that's because it was there a million and two years ago and so on ad infinitum. So there's something a little bit unsatisfactory about that. You could call that the, the chaotic catalog theory. But... Uh, the Krishna theory uh, 
means you have to go beyond atoms and numbers and so forth and describe something that's essentially unified. Of course, a lot of scientists will jump ship immediately as soon as you start saying something like that. But uh, the idea is that you have an eternally existing source that has unity and harmony in it, whereas this uh, just uh, chaotic catalog just has this little bit of information and that little bit of unrelated information and so on just there somehow. Well, the trouble with the simple idea is that um, ultimately information cannot be compressed beyond a certain limit. Nowadays, you can learn about this with computers because information compression has now become an important thing for computers. To cram more stuff onto your hard disk, you have an in information compression algorithm. Now, the trouble is if you compress it too much, too much, you can't get it back. It's like what I was saying about reversible and irreversible transformation. Uh, so information is compressible to a point. And then if you compress it more, then you lose information. So uh, if you say everything was simple, that would imply unlimited compressibility of information. But is that possible? Such a thing hasn't been demonstrated, and there's very good evidence against it. So, information theory goes against Darwin's theory of evolution. Or what it amounts to is, it says Darwin's theory of evolution ultimately depends on pure chance. All the talk about physical processes of selection and so on uh, really misses the, the essence of the thing. The essence of it is pure chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens on various occasions. Um, alignments that good happen every, let's say, 3,000 years or so. Uh, I checked it for the last 6,000 years. Uh, computers are, are great fun. What I did was just... Uh, Get an, ephemer, get an ephemeris program, and I had it check every day for the last uh, 6,000 years. That is from 4,000 B.C. up to 2,000 A.D. And uh, it ran for three days on a Pentium. But I got a readout of, you know, the planetary positions every day for the last 6,000 years. So uh, I know how many alignments there were, and it turned out there were three as good as the one in Kali Yuga. And uh, there were two others, as it turned out. So it's a pretty darn good alignment. Hmm? Events of the others? Is it the other date? Well, you see, the trouble with that, with that question is that history is full of disasters. Practically any year you can think of, something horrible happens. So uh, it's hard to say, but the two other dates, one of them was about 1500 B.C. and the other one was about 1000 B.C. So, yeah, they came close together, but those were the only ones. There were none in the A.D. period, curiously. So that's the way it worked out, yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's a metaphorical wheel, too. Yeah, it's a metaphorical wheel, although you can see it every night, if you'd like. Uh, the wheel of time, all the stars spin around every night. You can say the Big Dipper is like the hand of a clock, because the Big Dipper never, well, it, it's uh, under the horizon for part of the time. If you could see the Little Dipper more clearly, that would be a really nice clock hand, but it's hard to see. But you'd see it just spins around once every night, like a big clock. And then if you note the 
uh, the stars, every morning, if you look at the pattern of stars, you'll see it shifted a little bit. Uh, for example, the Pleiades, just before Mangalar Keep now, the Pleiades are over there. Um, you go back to about June, and they were just on the horizon, coming up, just before Mangalar Keep. So, things are gradually shifting. So, in a sense, you have a real clock in the sky. But, it's also metaphorical, because 360, uh, what have you got, joints, it says. Well, uh, that refers to days, obviously. Uh, 13 spokes would be months, and so forth. So in the fifth canto, where it refers to the chariot of the sun, it's uh, also a metaphorical chariot, because it's made of months and seasons and so forth. So... Mm-hmm. Pritu. Priyavrata. Right. Well, the sun isn't metaphorical. Um, I would say the chariot of the sun described in the fifth canto is metaphorical because it explicitly says that it's made of seasons, months, and so forth. So... That's metaphorical. Well, they're probably not metaphorical. <laughs> well, I've always wondered about that, because not only that, the volacilias are the size of a thumb, right? So, you have the sun, which is rather large, by all estimates, and then the sages in front of it are... Uh, are not just our size, which would be extremely small compared to the sun, but they're the size of a thumb, as a matter of fact. So, um, well, they're... Pardon me? Ah, who's thumb? Ah, that's a good question. I have to be careful with those sizes of thumbs. But, uh, in any case, of course, there's a story about the Valakilias and Garuda. Uh, it seems that uh, once upon a time, there, were t there was a gigantic tortoise and a gigantic, uh, I believe, elephant. And they were fighting since time immemorial. I almost think that they were supposed to be an incarnation of Vishishta and, and Vishwamitra in order to carry out their famous feud. So they were truly in the spirit of feuding. So this gigantic elephant and gigantic tortoise were battling away. And meanwhile, Garuda was um, quite young. He had just hatched out. And uh, he was a little bit awkward as a youth. Anyway, he was hungry. And Garuda is not a vegetarian. <laughs> so he was directed to uh, eat the elephant and the tortoise to put them out of their misery. So he grabbed one in each set of talons and flew off with them, and then he had to find a place to, to land in order to, to eat them, as any proper bird would do. So he landed on the limb of this gigantic tree, and the limb was many miles across or something like that. And of course his weight was so great that the limb broke off with a tremendous cracking sound, and he realized at that moment that the volacilias were on the limb of that tree. Excuse me? That's the length of the branch. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, in 800 miles, you can have a pretty big thumb. Uh, so anyway, the branch cracked off, and Garuda was warned, well, don't offend these sages. If they curse you, that would not be good. So he grabbed onto the branch, still holding onto the elephant and the tortoise, and I forget exactly how it ended up, but he managed to gently deposit the sages and then have his meal. Uh, so, anyway, small note on the, the Volachelias. <laughs> Pardon me? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, anyway... 
so dial very short power fan. Yeah, 